Neil, welcome to the podcast. Glad to have you on. Hey. Yeah. Perhaps you could uh, introduce yourself. Yeah. So, hey, I'm Neil. I work on mechanistic interpretability research, which means I take a network that's been trained to do a task, and I try to reverse engineer what algorithms it's learned and like how it does this, trying to be as faithful to what the model actually does as possible. A kind of form of digital neuroscience. I'm currently a independent researcher. I used to work at Anthropic, working on their transformer circuits work, and I generally try to work on reverse engineering language models. So with a bunch of dalliances through various side projects. So as I understand mechanistic interpretability, uh, it's a pretty early field. How how young is this field, would you say? Yeah, let's call it mechanterp. Mechanistic interpretability is such a mouthful. <laughs> And I want to make mechinterp a thing. Uh, so the field has a snappier name. Anyway, so mechinterp, I take the history. So deep learning as a whole has existed for about 10 years when um, AlexNet turned out to be way better at image classification than anything else. And this started becoming the hot thing that's basically entirely taken over the field of machine learning. And the subfield of interpret AI interpretability has only really been a thing since I don't know the history that well, but the first big paper I saw was in 2014 when people found a way to visualize early neurons in image networks and saw they were looking at things like edges and corners and things like that. And I would say that the, at least by my somewhat biased lights, the subfield of mechinterp has been massively pioneered by this researcher called Chris Ola, who was first involved in some work called Deep Dream at Google Brain, then ran the mechinterp team at OpenAI, doing this really great work on image circuits, where they reverse engineered different things in these image models. And since around late 2021, the field has heavily focused on transformer language models like ChatGPT and smaller versions of this, and trying to reverse engineer those. And the field has rapidly grown from mostly Chris's team and collaborators to a much larger field with multiple professors seriously interested, maybe five industry or nonprofit orgs having teams working on it some independent researchers like me, and hopefully it will keep growing and we will continue this glorious exponential trend of increasing by about 5x in the last year. But pretty young field. Yeah, pretty young field. Why is Mechinterp uh, useful? Why, how, would it, how would it look if, if we succeeded in this field? Sure. Are you asking me this from a AI, reducing AI X risk perspective or just a general, like, why would anyone care about this? I, I say let's start with the general, and then we can talk about the reducing AI X, X risk. Sure. So I think for why should anyone care about this? My first and foremost argument is just a kind of scientific and aesthetic argument, which is that machine learning is becoming an increasingly important part of the world. We are really good at giving models complex tasks, like Someone typed in a search query to Google, what do they want? What should I show them? And giving good answers. And these are people of solving tasks that we, we just have no idea how to write a program that can write poetry in the way that ChatGPT can, or explain jokes. And this is just really, really dissatisfying to me. This is not an acceptable state of the world that we have computer programs that can essentially speak English at a human level, but that we cannot write these programs ourselves. We can only train them via this enormous soup of data. And that's like my personal reason. Um, I generally think that just in a world that is being increasingly shaped by these systems, it's just really useful to understand what they're doing and why. For example, um, lots of people are pretty concerned about 
racism and sexism and algorithmic bias in models. If you can understand how this is implemented in the model, it seems like it should be much easier to check how well your techniques for producing this have worked, and ideally motivate new ones. We've got recommender systems that there are compelling arguments for doing pretty significantly negative things in the world. I think that if we could look inside of those systems and understand why they recommended what they recommended on like an actual algorithmic level, it would all of this would just be so much more grounded. And we could actually have rules and regulation and transparency around what was going on here. And then the cause closest to my heart is um, AI existential safety. The question of, it seems plausible we're going to be in a world with human-level AI systems where, without getting into arguments over the semantics of what that actually means, just systems that are capable of doing lots of complex tasks in the world, which may be acting towards goals and whose goals may be different from ours. And I think that the people making these systems are probably not going to want them to have misaligned goals, but that if we can't see what the goals are, and we can't see whether the model is actually being aligned versus doing something deceptive or just broken and not what we want, that it is much harder to actually get good outcomes here. Neil, could you tell us about some results from mechanistic interpretability that are interesting to you? Uh, perhaps you could touch on multiple results. Sure. All right. So um, a work particularly close to my heart is this project I worked on um, during my stint of independent research called... Uh, progress measures for grokking via mechanistic interpretability, where so grokking was this famous mystery in deep learning, where some researchers found that if you train a model or a small model on some algorithmic tasks, like modular addition, the um, and you give it say half of the data to train on and keep half of it that it never sees to test it on, it will initially memorize. It gets really good at the data it sees and it's terrible at the data it doesn't see. But then if you keep training for an incredibly long time, it will suddenly grok or generalize and learn how to do the data it hasn't seen yet. And this is kind of wild because it just keeps seeing the same data again and again. And the work I did was first to... So I figured this just has to be susceptible to mech and turn. It's a tiny model doing an algorithmic task. This is the kind of thing we are good at. And reverse engineered how it did modular addition, where it turned out to have learned this wild algorithm where it thought about the numbers it was adding as rotations around a circle and learns to compose the rotations together in this really weird trig identity and Fourier transform-based way that was ultimately very clean and legible. And then I could look into the model as it was training and saw that rather than suddenly figuring out the right solution, it actually slowly transitioned from the memorized solution to the generalized solution, but that it could only generalize data it hadn't seen yet when it was both capable of generalizing and wasn't also trying to memorize, but only when it was really good at generalizing did it decide it didn't need to bother memorizing. And that's a work I'm particularly proud of because, uh, well, it's the first research I like properly led. But also, I just feel like if Mechantup works, we should be able to demystify things like this. Um, a totally different work that I think is pretty exciting is this paper called Toy Models of Superposition from Anthropic, which people may have seen on Twitter as the Why on Earth is There a Tetrahedron in My Neural Network paper? where so superposition is this problem that comes up where so models have say n uh, have like say a thousand neurons in them and they want to represent features these properties of the input and often they will try to represent like a thousand features in there um like a feature per neuron and this is all very nice and reasonable but sometimes they seem to be doing this thing called superposition, 
where they actually have more than a thousand features and they can't do a feature per neuron and learn some weird compression scheme. And so Anthropic were like, this is an important, confusing phenomenon we want, to, want to, we want to understand better. Let's make a toy model that tries to simulate it so we can study it in this kind of metaphorical Petri dish. And they found that in the toy model they created, not only did it learn to use superposition, but that it learned these beautiful geometric configurations where, say, if you gave it 25 features and 10 neurons to shove them into, it would sometimes learn to compress the first five features into the first two neurons, the second five features into the second two neurons, etc. And you got kind of different levels of efi- compression efficiency, like tetrahedra have four features in five in three dimensions, which is um, higher fidelity than five in two. And models will slowly transition from tetrahedra to the next thing along. And it was just a beautiful paper. And the final work I want to highlight is this work from um, OpenAI called Multimodal Neurons in Artificial Neural Networks, where, so multimodal neurons in the brain are these neurons which activate on multiple representations of the same thing. For example, a drawing of Spider-Man the name Peter Parker, and like a picture of Spider-Man. The same neuron lights up, which is kind of fascinating, because it suggests there's some real abstraction going on. And they took this model called CLIP, which is part of how models like DALI, the image generation model, are trained, where CLIP takes in both an image and a text input. And they thought, this should probably have abstractions, because it's about image and text. And they looked at some of the neurons in the image half and tried to interpret what they represented. And they found all kinds of wild neurons, including a bunch of multimodal neurons, uh, like a Spider-Man neuron, or a bunch of conceptual neurons, like a teenage neuron or an anime neuron, which seemed to represent the abstract concept of anime or teenager. Um, or well, you got neurons for, say, France that are activated on... French language, the French flag, but also the bit of a map that represented France. And this is fascinating to me that this is a thing we can find in networks. And one of my side projects would be making this website called Neuroscope, which shows the text that most activates the features, the neurons in a bunch of language models. Or you can just go through and look at what kind of wild things models seem to potentially represent. Are there any concepts uh, that you that have, has been found in these um, in these neural networks that are that are entirely new? So I'm thinking that are there concepts that humans do not have that that could be find found in these neural neural networks? Unfortunately, I'm not currently aware of any examples. Though this feels like the kind of thing that should be possible. I'm particularly excited about work that looks at reverse engineering models like AlphaZero that are superhuman at Go or chess, because this is both a very kind of algorithmic and legible domain. These systems are also clearly vastly superhuman, but also there's been some promising work trying to interpret them, like this paper from DeepMind uh, from Tom McGrath called Acquisition of Chess Knowledge in AlphaZero, where they showed that if you just took a bunch of human chess concepts and looked for them in the model, you just find them. And further, that if you looked at when in training it had developed these, it you could compare it to the hist- human history of chess knowledge hmm. and see at what rate the model learned things that humans learned. And also found some fascinating quirks like phase transitions, where there's a certain point around step 30,000 when it learns a bunch of things at the same time, but nothing superhuman. This points in the direction of there being concepts that are generally useful uh, because the same concepts are found by artificial neural networks as are found by humans. Um, also, your, your, first, uh, your first example of an interesting paper uh, where uh, the beginning, in the beginning the, the model learns by memorization and then at some point generalizes 
that sounds to me a bit like perhaps the way that children learn math, uh, where in the beginning you you learn your multiplication tables, and then at a later point you understand uh, multiplication as more of an algorithm. So there are there are interesting parallels between uh, humans and AI systems here. Yes, and do you think it's easy to exaggerate the degree to which there are these analogies? I really don't like the term neural network for this exact reason because it sounds so biological and neurosciencey. But I think it's pretty plausible there are good analogies. We need interpretability research to understand what's going on such that we can see whether what we're doing is actually working. We need it to create these feedback loops between creating a system and then seeing how the system works and then improving the system. And if we don't understand what's going on, then it's much more difficult to actually say that we have we have improved because by which metric have we improved if we don't if we don't understand what's going on inside of these systems? Exactly. And I should flag, I'm extremely biased. I work in mechanistic interpretability. I like mechanistic interpretability a lot. I think it's promising, but I think there's a bunch of other routes by which we might reach this goal. And I think the field of make AI not kill everyone-ism is a healthier field if it has people pursuing a bunch of approaches, including people who aren't even doing this because they care about AI safety. They're doing this because it's just really fascinating and they want to understand models better. Okay, so how promising would you say that mechanistic interpretability is? Sure. So for the abstract question of how promising, I'd say surprisingly promising in that the field has made vastly more progress than I thought was possible, but also not very promising in the sense of, oh my god, this is such an ambitious task, and so few people work on it, um, where, I don't know, my experience getting into the field has been something like, well, there's no way networks are interpretable. They're just a massive soup of linear algebra. They're basically a kind of fancy curve-fitting algorithm or just an inscrutable black box. They're not trained to be interpretable, so they have no incentive to be. And then, oh ha, you can actually find meaningful interpretable neurons and image models and meaningful uh, circuits, where circuit here means kind of subset of the model's neurons and parameters that do some task. And then, but this is really specific to image models because those are so human-like. We have this visual cortex. And then there's kind of worked on language models, uh, on like small language models, and there's been promising results in larger language models. But also, actually being able to meaningfully reverse engineer something non-trivial in a model like GPT-3 is just ludicrously ambitious and harder than anything you've done so far. So I consider it very much an open scientific question of whether this will actually work. I think it is a bet worth making, but I do not think it is a bet that like we should go all in on or that it's obviously the one true path to things going well in terms of per like interesting results and reasons for optimism um there was this uh paper from the anthropic interpretability team that i was a bit involved in called in context learning and induction heads which i think is probably the most compelling result i've seen on looking at these models actually telling us something deep about them so an induction head in brief is this uh circuit we found in these uh two-layer attention-only language models all right so zooming out a bit of induction head specifically um the kinds of models we study and try to reverse engineer are transformer language models like chat gpt Fundamentally, it's about modeling sequences. You give it a sequence of words, and you train it to predict the next word. Like, you give it a page of a book, and you ask it what comes, ne- what comes first on the next page of the book. And you, this is a kind of weird and arbitrary thing you might train a model to do. Um, but it's really convenient, because one, this is like a pretty hard task. Uh, it sounds kind of easy, but if you imagine, say, getting the first five pages of a book and ending halfway through page six and then predicting what comes next. This is actually kind of a sophisticated task that implicitly involves learning a bunch of things like 
facts about the world, structures of grammar, reasoning. Um, as people who play with ChatGPT probably know, how poetry and rhyming works. And then uh, it's also really convenient because you can just give it a massive soup of data, uh, which automatically comes with labels of what the next word is. And so you train it to do this on a massive, massive mountain of text. And then internally, the transformer is all about representing sequences, which can kind of vary in length. A transformer should work on a sequence with like one word and a sequence with a thousand words. And so internally, the model is made up of these um, layers, these simple functions. And transformers are made up of alternating um, attention and MLP layers. MLP stands for multi-layered perceptron, but you don't need to care about what that means. And so they're modeling the sequence of words. And what they're basically trying to do is they take each word and then they do some processing. And after each step, you get a refined representation of each word which is integrated in some context and processing from the surrounding words so that you slowly get a better and better understanding of what's going on there, what context the word is in, so that you can eventually predict what comes next. And then there's these two types of layers which kind of do this incremental processing. The first type is an attention layer. So at its heart, because the model is a sequence modeling thing, it's doing things in parallel on each word. But obviously you need to move information between words. And so attention um, is all about figuring out which other words and their context is most relevant to the current word for the specific task the head is doing. Um, attention layers are made up of heads which specialize into different kinds of processing. And then it identifies what's most relevant it identifies some important information there, and it copies it to the current thing. And then they're about like rooting information around. Perhaps an example here could be good. So say that say that we've uh, the model has landed on apple, and then it's trying to predict what comes next. And say the next word uh, in in its training uh, data is tree. Then it's looking around for other words that might be relevant for for predicting what comes after Apple. Would would that be an, a reasonable example? Yeah, I, I think maybe a clearer example would be something where you can see what kind of thing the model is thinking. So, let's say you've got a, um, some text like the Eiffel Tower is located in the city of, and um, empirically models know that Paris comes next, and um, but the information that Paris comes next comes from the of word. But like, of clearly doesn't have enough to know what's going on. And it turns out there are some heads which learn to look at the word tower. Um, earlier bits of the model have integrated in the context that tower is part of Eiffel Tower, and which have looked up the fact that Eiffel Tower is in Paris. And then this head moves that from the tower bit to the of bit and uses that to output Paris comes next. And actually the same heads will do things do this for like things like the Colosseum is located in or the Parthenon is located in. And yeah, you often get heads for grammatical structures like look at the first word in the sentence, look at the subject of the current sentence, etc. And so these these induction heads uh, are that's the impressive thing that's been reverse engineered uh, within mechanistic interpretability so far. Mm -hmm. Yes. So induction heads are part of an attention layer, um, where the attention layer is built up of these heads that can kind of be thought of as independently. And because it's an attention layer, this is the model doing something sophisticated with finding relevant information and moving it around. And the task being done is... So, a fact about text is it often contains repeated text. For example, um, if I see the word Michael, 
it's pretty hard to figure what comes next. It's probably some famous celebrity, like Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan, whatever, but it's hard to know exactly which. But if, in the past, uh, the text Michael Jackson appeared, then it's pretty likely that Jackson comes next. And so a pretty great algorithm a model can learn is, okay, let's look for... Um, to let's look for a word that came after Michael in the past, and then let's move the information from that word to where I currently am. So I predict that that word comes next, whatever that is. And um, we reverse engineered these things called induction heads, which implement that. And it's worth noting, this isn't just the model memorizing something like, Jackson often comes, often comes after Michael. If Michael Jackson came up in the past, this comes next. It's actually just like an actual algorithm that is run on any input. You can just give it some random gibberish text that's randomly generated, then just copy and paste that, and then run the model. And it will predict that the copied and pasted text, it will predict the copied and pasted text really well, even though it's never seen anything like that before. So it's a general algorithm. It's not a, it's not a set of fixed rules um, involving specific words. It's, it's a general algorithm that can work on arbitrary words, but which does this very specific task. Yeah. Like, it's not a lookup table, but it's also not, like, intelligence in any meaningful sense. But I can see how reverse engineering something like that is actually impressive, because now we're beginning to understand what's going on inside of these previously entirely black box systems that just predict the next word in the text. Yes. So I think that reverse engineering induction heads is, like, cool. Though, probably sounds a lot easier than it actually is from the outside. But they're not the reason that I raised the induction heads paper. Um, so we actually reverse engineered induction heads in this earlier paper called A Mathematical Framework for Transformer Circuits. And um, I feel like I shouldn't be saying we. Uh, this paper was written by um, Catherine Olson... Nelson Elhage, Chris Ola, and the rest of Anthropic, and I was somewhat involved, but they get a large amount of the credit for doing great pioneering work in this field. Um, and I definitely don't want to claim that this is my work. But yeah, so these induction heads, um, we found them by looking at these tiny two layer attention only models. And then we um, looked at larger models. And it turns out that. Not only do all models that people have looked at have these heads, um, up to about 13 billion parameters. Um, since leaving, I actually had a fun side project of looking at all the open source models I could find, and uh, I found them in about uh, the 41 models I checked, all of them that were big enough to have induction heads had them. And not only do they appear everywhere, they also all appear in this sudden, what we call a phase transition, where, so as you're training the model, if you just keep checking, does this have induction heads? Does this have induction heads? There's this narrow band of training um, between about 5 to 10% of the way through training. Uh, exact numbers vary, but that's kind of the idea. Um, the model goes from no induction heads to basically fully formed induction heads. And this is enough of a big deal that if you look at the like uh, loss curve, which is the jargon for how good the model is at its task, there's this visible bump where the model is smoothly getting better, and then briefly gets better much faster, and then returns to its previous level of smoothly getting better when these induction heads fall. So that's wild. Then the next totally wild thing about induction heads is that they're really important for this thing models can do called in-context learning. So a general fact about language models that are trained to predict the next word is that the more previous words you give them, the better they are, which is kind of intuitive. If you're trying to predict what comes next in the sentence, the cat said on the mat, um, like what comes after um, on the in on the, if you just have the, it's really hard. If you've got on the, it's a bit easier. If you've got the cat sat on the, it's like way easier. But it's not obvious that if you add more than 100 words, it really matters. And in fact, older models weren't that good at using words more than 100 words back. And it's kind of 
not obvious how you to do this, though clearly it should be possible. For example, if I'm reading a book, the chapter heading is probably relevant to figuring out what comes next. Or like if I'm reading an article, the introduction is pretty relevant. But it's definitely a weird thing that models can do this. And it turns out that induction heads are a really big part of how they're good at this, where models that are capable of forming induction heads are much better at this thing of tracking long-range dependencies in text. The ability of models to do this perfectly coincides with the dramatic bit where they're, where they're learnt, and when we did things like tweaking a model too small to have induction heads with this hard-coded thing that made induction heads more natural to form, that model got much better at tracking how to use text far back to predict the next thing. And we even found some heads that seem to do more complicated things like translation, where you give it a text in English, you give it a text in French, and it looks at the word in English that came after the corresponding word in French. These, these also seem to be based on induction heads. These induction heads, they, they pop up uh, in many different uh, neural networks, in, in, in many of the neural networks that you've checked uh, at a certain size. Is this, is this perhaps analogous to how, say, eyes have evolved in, in uh, different species and underwater and on land and so on? Because maybe induction heads are, are very generally useful for language models. Yeah. Um, I think that's a pretty good analogy. I yeah, that's actually a pretty great analogy. I think one thing worth drawing out from that analogy is that there's two big components to what kind of things a model might le- an organism might learn. There's what is the environment it's in, what's useful, and there's kind of what constraints does it have and what's natural. And light, light is there. Light is useful. Understanding your environment is important, so eyes are valuable. And the same kind of underlying biology presumably incentivizes eyes. Though I'm not a biologist, so I don't actually know how much eyes are implemented in the same way or not. And I think the analogy from biology to AI can be a bit overdone, but this underlying principle of repeated text happens a lot and it's useful to notice, and Induction heads are a very natural thing for a model to express that's kind of efficient in the same way that, I don't know, walking on legs is more efficient than growing your own wheels. Even (laughs) if probably we could figure that out, biology could figure that out if it really had to. All right. So say induction heads are an example of of a way in which we can understand what's going on inside of these uh, neural networks. I would like us to, to pivot a bit to talk about how does this line of research help make us safer. So you, you mentioned that that your uh, largest motivation for working, or perhaps uh, say at least one of your motivations uh, for working on this is to help uh, reduce AI risk. So it, how, how do you see mechanistic interpretability helping there? This definitely is only one of my motivations. I generally think of my life as having kind of multiple different categories of motivation. There's the high-level, abstract, zoom in every few months and think about my life goals and meaning, where, okay, I think that human-level AI is I think that's probably going to happen and plausibly might go badly, and I want to be doing things that address this because making the world a better place is of deeply important value to me. But also, on a day-to-day basis, that's like not the kind of thing I can really draw excitement from. And things like, oh my god, this is so fun, I get to stare at an alien organism all day, and probe its brain for how it works. Or, huh, lots of people around me are really smart and excited about my work and think I'm really cool for doing it, is another thing that appeals to the kind of monkey inside my brain. And part of how I try to set my life is to align these various different things that don't by default point the same way, to align with my abstract, high-level, actually what matters to me, but really hard to feel and practice. I'm very concerned about models being deceptive, and in particular, models being deceptive in a way that's hard to notice, where the model realizes it's being trained, 
it realizes it's in its interests for its human operators to think it's doing what they want and being aligned and performing well. And so it learns to fake doing that. And if it's competent, which the models I'm scared about are, then it will just do this well. It will do this in a way that's as close as it can get to what a system that genuinely cared will do. And fundamentally, when there are multiple solutions inside a model that both have the same outputs, one of the obvious things to do is to open up the black box of the model, look inside, and try to poke around at what's going on. And this is one of the ways I think mechanistic interpretability is likely to be pretty promising. In particular, I'm really excited about there being better feedback loops for people trying to align these systems, where, especially as you get closer to the worlds which are actually dangerous, where we might have systems that are capable enough to do damage and also capable enough to realize they might want to do damage. I think that having really good feedback on how well the alignment techniques work in a way that is not tied up with things like um, the model just making mistakes, and which can ideally be as fine-grained and mechanistic as possible, seems like a pretty valuable thing to exist. Though I also just have a skepticism of careful, elaborate arguments in general, and think that anyone trying to reason about a complex problem like AI safety should share this skepticism. And I think for me, obviously, if we understand the uh, terrifying black boxes who might be massively influencing the world, it is more likely to go better for humanity. I think that kind of very simple argument satisfies a different part of me. Yeah, I, I, I can see how that argument is, is powerful. So um, there's a question I have about... Um, Mechanistic interpretability, we might, this might help us understand what's going on inside of these black box systems, right? But if we, if we discover that something we do not like is going on, is there a part of mechanistic interpretability that helps us control the system or steer the system in a different way? Or is that where you imagine another approach in, within AI safety takes over? So is mechanistic interpretability mostly about detecting bad behavior uh, not about actually steering or controlling AI systems in the right direction. So, in my personal conception, mechanistic interpretability is about reverse engineering a trained system rather than about intervening on that system to change what it does. I think that it's easy to get into semantics here, where, I don't know, um, Maybe if you're a doctor, you refer to your instru your instruments as like a very different part of medicine as like the actually cutting people open and making them better. But these are clearly highly related things, and better instruments enable better medication um, and better surgery techniques. And I also think it's kind of healthy for mechanistic interpretability to try to get feedback on kind of actually do things. Um, there's this. A great paper called Rome from David Bao and Kevin Meng, where they did some work to try to track down which bits of a model contain factual knowledge, like the Eiffel Tower is in Paris, but then which also use this to. But then uh, the focus of the paper was on this memory editing technique, where they change it so the model thinks the Eiffel Tower is actually in Rome. And they got some pretty impressive results. Like if you ask it something like the. Um, can you give me directions to the Eiffel Tower? It will direct you to its Italian railway stations rather than French railway stations. Um, and it's kind of wild, though I also think that the paper is kind of flawed in some ways, and there's been some recent interesting criticism. Um, but I think I'm pretty excited about that kind of attempt, where if we really understand how models work, then we sh these kind of things are, should be much easier. Because to me, a lot of the field of AI is kind of floundering around in the dark. And I mean, one concerning implication of that statement is that if we really understand these systems, we should be able to make better ones faster. And in my opinion, even if I want to live in a world with like safe and aligned powerful systems one day, 
I would like, I feel like the making them better is vastly outstripping the understanding them and making them safer. And I want the relative speed to be as great as possible on the safer side. So, so Neil, I have a, a kind of a, a, a weird question here. So what, I'm, what I could be worried about is say that you do some mechanistic interpretability research and then it's, it's published online in, in a paper or say it's, it's written up in a blog post. And this then becomes part of the training set for a future language model. Could the research you're doing uh, now help future language models deceive us um, because it understands how we're trying to interpret it? Uh, yes. There are totally worlds where that happens. And it does seem like this is not on my list of things I am concerned about in <laughs> the short term or even things that are high on my list of ways I think that doing my research could be harmful. But definitely could happen. Uh, one idea which I've seen being popular on the 11th forum that I find very fun is uh, there's, uh, there's this um, string that the people who made Big Bench, which is this new big set of benchmarks and metrics we use to test language models, made, where they have this string they want to put in documents that contain like the answers to these questions such that future language models can just be t when you get the data set for future language models you can just say don't include things with this string and there's a very fun idea of just put this in like all alignment posts so we don't tip off the model <laughs> um but so to me this kind of links into the more interesting question of if you know that someone is trying to read your mind can you outthink them and my personal guess is that it is at the very least significantly harder for a model to outthink a mind reader than it is for the model to deceive an operator. One of the main reasons I believe this is I think that getting better at something is fundamentally about getting feedback, and models are trained to get lots and lots of feedback on their outputs, but models are not trained to get lots of feedback on their internals and how much a mind reader can see them. Um, note that this argument does break if people start doing things like training on an interpretability-inspired metric or giving feedback via it, which I think is a thing that I am extremely cautious about recommending anyone does for this exact reason. And having techniques so robust they can't be broken is much, much harder. I. Yeah, I think that, like, I don't know how I would think my thoughts such that a digital neuroscientist could read this and, like, not see it. I think there's a couple of ideas people have floated with me that kind of make sense. Like, spend a bit of time thinking about what intentions I'm forming and why, and then spend most of my time just acting on these cached intentions without dwelling on how I came up with them, is one tactic. Another tactic would just be think in like really weird and convoluted ways and keep away from the dangerous thoughts. And I can imagine some of these working, especially if a model has some external memory, it can store these cached intentions in, in a way that's kind of divorced from how they were generated. We should flag that all of this is, is very speculative and it is not Completely. your main concern. <laughs> yes. Yes, this is very much on my list of fun things I might speculate about with friends at 1am. <laughs> rather than a thing that is actually a thing I think about doing day-to-day -day research. Okay, let, let's dig into some of what I could see as being problems with uh, mechanistic interpretability as a, as a research uh, paradigm. So, uh, I think the main worry I have is just that mechanistic interpretability is not fast enough. So uh, how I would frame this is to say that when we learn, when we get actual feedback from the systems uh, that were cutting edge two years ago, there are now new systems, and we have not been fast enough to implement the learnings in the new systems. So in a sense, you're always playing catch-up, or at least that's, that's my fear. Um, what, do you think that's, that's, a, that's a real worry? So this definitely is a real worry. I will point out that I would argue that the field of mechanistic interpretability of language models didn't even exist two years ago. And all existing work was on image models, such that I'm, I don't know, I feel less bad about that one. Um, 
But I do think this is an important point. And what, so there's a couple of underlying questions here. There's, are we just capable of doing this at all? Maybe we could do GPT-3 given two years, but then if GPT-4 is 10 times bigger, it would take us 20 years, and that's not sustainable. Um, but then there's just questions like, are we just going to kind of always going to be scrapping our previous work? Or can we be building a field? Or like building upon our previous work, even as the exact focus changes? And I'm reasonably optimistic about the building on our progress one. I think that a bunch of our insights and conceptual frameworks from image models transferred, though definitely imperfectly and less well than I'd have hoped. And there were lots of weird things about transformers. For example, image models don't have attention layers, and a bunch of the work has focused on understanding what's up with attention layers. And so that's a category of concern. I think on the will the problem of scale, can we actually interpret these humongous models? even if we can interpret a smaller model. I'm kind of unsure. I am excited about things that try to take insights from Mechinterp and scale them and automate them. And I think that one kind of speculative dream might be that even if we know how we would inter- reverse engineer GPT-4 given 20 years, before we get to the really scary systems, we'll hopefully have systems that are kind of near human and can take over a lot of cognitive work. And if we could have these systems try to help us um, and just do this 20 years of work in weeks instead, that seems in some sense like a massive win that could actually scale. But yeah, I think one thing I will say that's maybe one of my more controversial opinions is that I think that the field of interpreting AI is much, much more bottlenecked by really rigorous, true beliefs about networks than it is by good ideas for things that would scale and would actually generalize to larger models. And I think that it's just very hard to tell which of the data is good, which of the data have subtle flaws. And I feel like just doing work to find even some cherry-picked thing like induction heads that we then try to really deeply understand, or trying to discover some more of the underlying principles behind the kinds of algorithms the models learn, and the kinds of ways they express things, even if the exact details don't generalize, just seems like it should enable all further things to do with understanding these models. Because at the moment, it feels like we're floundering in the dark. So if we imagine that we have AIs helping us interpret other AIs, so help, so AIs helping us uh, understand what's going on inside of other neural networks, couldn't this, in a sense, uh, lead us back to where we started? Because maybe the way that that one AI is being interpreted by another is perfectly understandable to, to, the, enti- to the AI that's doing the interpreting, but... Perhaps it's it's an uh, inefficiency to try to translate it into something that's that's understandable by humans. Perhaps uh, an AI trained to interpret another AI could skip the the step of producing something that's that's understandable by humans and thereby work faster. Perhaps it could outcompete systems that try to translate to human. I'm not sure I quite followed the question. Is what you're asking? If we try to train systems to interpret more complex systems, maybe those would be too slow and inefficient, such that a system that's not trying to translate this to human ease is just much more capable? Exactly, yeah. So imagine that we have a a system, an AI that's interpreting another AI, and we have two of such systems. We have one system that delivers something that's understandable by humans, and we have another system that just delivers red or green, let's say. So just thumbs up or thumbs down uh, without giving us ac- actual information about what's what's uh, what's going on it just says this uh, this uh, 
this system is doing what you want it to do. Could you could you see a, a world in which the system that that gives us very little information but just gives us a, us a thumb up or a thumb down would outcompete the system that that tries to do the hard work of translating a neural network into something that's humanly understandable. So to me, outcompete kind of seems like the wrong framing. I don't think that the question is not if you had two competing auditing companies, one of whom did the red green thing, one of whom did the sophisticated thing, which then would make more money. If we end up in a world where it's possible to make the extremely expensive, sophisticated thing that translates it into human ease, that's just, that's a massive win. Like um, pharmaceutical companies spend billions of dollars making sure their products are safe when. YOLO, put it on the market and don't check is much cheaper. But, you know, we have regulation that make it so that you need to do the really hard, expensive thing that's better at making things safer. And I'm, like, really not that concerned about it will just be too inefficient or too expensive. I'm much more concerned about A, we won't be able to do it. B, it will be so prohibitively expensive or slow that it's not even possible to do practically even if we know how to do it in theory and finally that it's just not reliable we can't trust this system and we just get lost in the ch nested chains of more and more sophisticated systems and on the specific point of practicalities and kind of competition i think one thing which is easy to overlook here is that Mechanistic interpretability is not necessarily about auditing every single action a system takes. It's much more about taking the system and trying to understand it. Clinical trials are maybe a good analogy in this context, where it's not like you watch a patient as you give them the... It's not like you, when you deploy a drug in the world, you watch every patient as they take it. You study the drug in this clinical context, that is as close to the real world as you can make it, ideally by just giving it to people and then see what happens and get data. And this can be vastly more, this can be expensive in a way that watching everyone who takes a COVID vaccine is just completely impractical. And models are even better because there is just a long but finite list of numbers, the parameters that just define the model. And if we can just study this do a bunch of running the model on inputs, but fundamentally just understand what it represents, then I think the questions about competitiveness just matter a lot less there. But you think that mechanistic interpretability will have to involve uh, AIs interpreting other AIs at some point for it to scale to bigger systems? I think it is plausible that this is a thing that happens. And it is plausible that the most practical path to meaningfully understanding like really complicated systems is via using less dangerous AI assistance. I do not think this is an important thing in the near-term future of the field. I do not think this is ne even necessary before we could reverse engineer a human-level system, at least enough to figure out whether it's safe. And this is not at all what I am personally am working on. This is very much in the speculative, what I think could happen. I think in particular, if we're trying to figure out how we could align a vastly, vastly superhuman system, I struggle to imagine it really being doable to perfectly reverse engineer by humans. Though I think that fully reverse engineering is not on the critical path from where we are now to having safe AI. Just the ability to look does this have internal rep internally represented goals? And if so, what are the goals? Or is this being deceptive? Just seems significantly easier. Yeah, that's a great way to frame it. Okay, so I I read one objection to the whole mechanistic interpretability uh, paradigm or um, research field, which is that uh, when you're when you're trying to interpret a neural network, you you cannot on this, you cannot from interpreting the network itself understand how the system will react in different environments. So imagine that you cannot get information about how the system will react in, in a diverse set of environments. 
And so therefore, there's a, there's a fundam fundamental limit to how much you can get out of interpreting these networks. Do, do you think that's a reasonable objection? My off-the-cuff answer is no. Um, in particular, to me, one of the things that's distinctive about mechanist mechanterp and reverse engineering the system is that you you're understanding the algorithms the model employs and if you actually understand an algorithm you should be able to predict how it generalizes you should be able to come up with adversarial examples that will trip the system up using your understanding you should be able to predict what happens on weird settings uh induction heads are a good example where Understanding them let us predict that models could, if given complete random gibberish text, predict repeated subsets of that, and they can. And I'm unconvinced by that criticism. I do think there's some truth to it, in that it's very easy to impose your own preconceptions on what behavior you should look for, what kinds of inputs you give it, such that you see what lights up and how you focus on things. And I think in particular, if you aren't trying to fully reverse engineer the system, but are just trying to localize the bits that matter most, the criticism has more teeth to me. But in my eyes, Mechanterp is one of the more promising things that isn't susceptible to that criticism. Because we're trying to understand what algorithm underlies the network itself, which is kind of understanding a more general feature of, the, of, the, of a neural network. Yes. And I think there's other techniques and approaches that also seem pretty valuable here. There's the area of adversarial training and adversarial robustness, where you get an adversary, like a human rater or another AI, to generate examples tried, trying to throw off the system. And adversarial examples are a good example of this. The pictures listeners might have seen where you have a Panda, you add a bunch of random noise, and it thinks it's definitely a wombat or something. Even though, to our eyes, it looks just like exactly like a panda, and they've just imperceptibly changed a couple of pixels. And yeah, one field is about trying to find the inputs that will most trip up the model that are least like what it's expecting. And that's another angle to figuring out what it does in weird contexts. But I'm honestly not really aware of many others that I think are as promising as Mechanterp here. Okay, so actually you think this objection applies the least to Mechanterp compared to other, uh, other approaches? I don't like using superlatives, but kind of. And to be clear, I think it does apply, I just think it applies a lot less. Yeah. All right. So let's say that people have been listening to this and they are now excited about uh, Mechanterp. They want to help contribute to this field. What would be the best ways to get into this? What, what should, which papers or books uh, or video series should you, should you read? Should you go to hackathons? How would you go about getting into the field? Sure. So actually, one of my side projects for the last couple of months has been trying to make this dramatically easier. And I have this post called Concrete Steps to Get Started in Mechanistic Interpretability, which you can find if you go to neilnanda.io slash getting dash started. And this tries to give a pretty concrete guide to what I think you should do if you actually want to learn about the field and potentially do research, and tries to collate a lot of the other resources I've made and other things I think are useful and good for this. Um, generally, I think one of the really great things about Mechanterp is that, one, there's lots of important work to be done on tiny systems that can fit on a free Google Colab notebook in your browser rather than needing some expensive supercomputer, and which you can just play around with and get fast feedback within minutes, especially using some of the demos I and collaborators have made where you can just play around with a model by running existing code. And I would recommend people just like, Go and screw around with the various educational materials. Um, read some of the papers recommended. Um, for people who want to dig more in, I have the sequence that I'm pretty satisfied with called 200 Concrete Open Problems in Mechanistic Interpretability, where I try to both just like lay out a map of the field, what I think are the interesting sub-areas, big open questions, 
how I think about doing research in those traps, pitfalls, tips, but also just a long list of concrete problems I would be excited for someone to go and work on. Would this be would this be the best best approach? Say that a listener has a general background in computer science and is interested in this. Should is the best way to to jump into one of these two hundred uh, problems and try to solve it and then fail and then you know get feedback from from trying to solve an actual problem? Or would you rather have a, a, a more expanded base of of theory by reading some papers? And how would you how would you start? I personally think that most people I see getting into the field spend way too long reading papers and trying to build a broad base and not enough time just doing things. And I think that building a broad base is important, but I think that the best way to build the base is by doing things, failing, noticing what you're stuck at, and using this to ground your learning. And I think that going back once you've gotten your hands dirty and going and just like going on a learning binge and trying to fill in a bunch of the holes in your knowledge is like solidly worthwhile. And I think there's a learning style which just prefers reading a bunch of papers. And my Getting Started guide also tried to give some concrete advice for that. But code fast, code early, try to build practical knowledge as well as theory is some of the most common advice I give to people trying to get into the field. And again, one of the things that's really nice about Mech and Turp is there's lots of small bite-sized problems. I tried to rank the problems in my sequence by difficulty, and there's a rank for, I think someone who's new to the field could like probably get a good amount of traction on this in like a week or two. And I think that just trying to do something is one of the best ways to get grounding and get started. Fantastic. Perfect. <laughs>